This episode brought to you by Stamps.com. Why go to the store to get stamps when you can have them printed right at home for your convenience? Is kind of like a no. Next, <sighs> Malcolm, this is ridiculous. Not everybody has a secret furry crush. Spoken like a true furry virgin. Don't oh. say those words together. Look, I'm not saying everybody is into this, but everyone has at least that one where they find a slight attraction. Everyone? Everyone in our line of work. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. If I was watching us right now, I totally believe we were all into this. Mm. So it's only a matter of time before we find the gateway furry that arouses your entry. Your wording is not helping this process. Next! Do these count? That depends. How does it make you feel? Confused. Everything about this makes us confused. Then we're on the right track! <sighs> Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Crick. I remember it so you don't have to. There's no doubt about it, the furry community has become a big thing since I started this job. It's come a long way since my Space Jam review when I talked about the sexualization of Lola Bunny. Have you ever seen a bunny that you actually had the hots for? That hardly seems like a very profitable demographic! How wrong I was! It turns out there's a huge community that loves these type of characters. And, like many of you, my reaction was probably similar to yours. Stay the hell away from my cats. But as the community grew and I got to know more of them, it seemed like the people into that were the outliers. I'm sure there's creeps like there are in any large community, but the ones I've known just seem to like their costumes, roll with the jokes made about them, and all around seem pretty harmless. The community has arguably been more accepted now than it's ever been in the past. But it is weird. Not that weird always connects to something awful, but it is weird. But I don't know, a lot of strange stuff people saw as weird in the past have become more normalized and even mainstream. To the point where I have to ask, does everybody secretly have one? The same way people joke about that person they change teams for, does everybody secretly have that one furry they change textures for? The answer is clearly no, because I do not. So that means not everybody does. I mean, Gadget was okay, I guess, but... No, no, she's a mouse, that's a mouse, I don't want to bang a mouse! Though I guess if you change the ears and the nose, it's basically a woman. Dude, she's like three inches tall! What would the children look like? This is crazy! Crazy like that skin-tight jumpsuit. Damn it, why'd you have to show that slide?! See? I knew we'd find at least one! Okay, fine. But you know what? I'll just say it. I'm a guy. Guys are into weirder stuff when it comes to sex. Hey, that's... pretty indisputable. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, so you're not gonna get them on anything! Is that so? Any thoughts when it comes to... this one? No. Seriously? Though definitely viewed as a Disney staple, 1973's Robin Hood has gained a following for... um... different reasons. Watching it years later, it's not hard to see why. Or maybe for some it is hard. Uh, without even realizing it, this movie hit on all sorts of, shall we say, unique curiosities. It's actually pretty hilarious watching this movie with all the... I'm assuming unintentional innuendos going on. But even if you don't get a big laugh out of those moments, the movie's a pretty enjoyable good time. Despite, I guess it, not getting the best reviews. Many critics said the film lacked the epic qualities and artistic merit both the story and past Disney films possessed. I guess I can see where they're coming from, but I feel like the movie makes it clear it wants to be a more laid back and comical telling of the story. But when it does need to be adventurous or romantic or large in scale, I think it meets that criteria fine. It just doesn't surpass it. The film was so popular it was actually the start of Disney releasing their animated films on home media. And when they saw how many families bought and watched it repeatedly, it gave them the inspiration to release the rest of their films as well. Man, imagine if they start with Million Dollar Duck. Maybe we'd never have this on physical media. Part of the charm of the film is the casting. Everybody brings a literal unique voice you can instantly grasp and gravitate to. Several of them were known for their works in westerns because, well, the film was originally going to be set in the Old West. Yeah, isn't that strange? 
When that idea was crap, they found they loved the actors they hired so much that they didn't want to get rid of them. So that's why Jolly Old England has a sudden influx of what sounds like Banjo playing prospectors. So, how did this anime classic win its way into our hearts aside from, well, other reasons? Well, we're gonna take a closer look to find out. And look, don't judge us too harshly, okay? Yeah, Kimmy Schmidt found him attractive too! When you were little, did you think he was handsome? Are you kidding? That voice? And how he didn't wear pants? Mm. You're comparing yourselves to a woman who lived her life in a cult? If it was a Robin Hood cult, I'd be very into that. You know there was a cult around Gadget. Oh, see, Critic? Now you don't have to feel like an outcast! Okay, I'm learning way too much about all of this and all of you, and this is why none of you are sitting next to me! Whatever. Let's Google random words until we figure out what other weird shit we're into. Ooh, my morning routine. Let's take a look at Robin Hood. But not in that way. I like we open on this book of Robin Hood explaining what an epic figure he was, but the movie's like, Hey, what's the story of that decorative doodle? Do they have a Robin Hood? Instant movie. You know, there's been a heap of legends and tall tales about Robin Hood, but we folks of the animal kingdom have our own version. The funny thing is, you'd think a Disney movie where humans replace animals entirely, you know, with them walking on two feet and everything, would be very common. Weirdly though, there hasn't been one before or since until the DuckTales movie in 1990. And after that, Chicken Little in 2005. Believe it or not, we actually have more Disney films where people are replaced with transportation than animals. That is odd. <laughs> It's the story of what really happened in Sherwood Forest. Oh, Grandpa's drunk and humming the hamster dance again. Actually, that is kind of the history of that song. Robin Hood and Little John walking through the forest. As mentioned, Robin Hood and his merry man, Little John, rob from the rich to give to the poor and are constantly hunted by the Sheriff of Nottingham. You know something, Robin? You're taking too many chances. You must be joking! That's Brian Bedford as Robin and Phil Harris as Little John. And if you think he's eerily similar to Baloo, it's because he pretty much played him all his life. But we never rob. We just sort of borrow a bit from those who can afford it. Ah, a socialist film. Wait, taxing is bad in this movie too. I don't know what this movie's political lean is. We're introduced to hands down the best characters in the movie, Prince John and Hiss. Played by Peter Ustinov and Terry Thomas. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You have an absolute skill for encouraging contributions from the poor. <laughs> Disney may brag they have gay characters now, but we all know these two beat them to the punch. That and, like, four of the dwarves. And how well King Richard's crown sits on your noble brow. I've told you never to mention my brother's name. Yeah, that's not the only time he's choking the snake. Seriously, not since the Chipette's son getting lucky with you have I asked, what is gonna happen to these reptiles? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Please don't do that. Mm -mm. You have a very loud thumb. And it reminds me too much of our Saturday Night Roleplay. It seems his can hypnotize people because... Ka could do it, I don't know. And he used it to convince John's brother, Richard, to go on his crusade. Hypnotism can rid you of your psychosis. No! None of that! None of that! That's how you got me to go on the first date with you! In fact, how'd you get this position? In fact, what is your position? I get at all positions. You get at all positions. Not even ten minutes in and we get cross-dressing. This movie's gonna be DeviantArt bingo. Get the dough with your horoscope! They may be bandits. Oh, Bobbycock. Female bandits? What next? They remind me of me when I was a lady. Gracious. <laughs> I told you no tongue in public. Just for that, I'm going to tie you up and sit on your face. Don't Give me that look! I am literally describing what's going on here! From the mists of time come forth spirits. For having such an elegant voice, Bedford does a good job with a zany range of characters for Robin to disguise himself as. Naughty, naughty, you mustn't touch, young man. <laughs> Tell me now, did me old ears hear someone singing a birthday ditty? I'm tip top all right, but I'm not as good as he is. <laughs> It reminds me of Babes in Toyland when Tom dresses as the fortune teller. I like when a stereotypical stoic lead is allowed to act goofy. <laughs> Literally every frame of the scene has a fur affinity page on it. They rob the prince, which makes me wonder how the hell he got all that off him without noticing. I know that's not an invitation for you to explain in the comments. And the coach falls apart because they stole half of that too. Mommy! <laughs> I've got a dirty thumb. My god, I've never seen a movie do so much without realizing they're doing it! Greetings from your friendly neighborhood tax collector. 
Pat Butlin plays the sheriff, who you wouldn't think would be that great a bad guy voice, but because he takes so much joy in the villainy, he does, even to the point of announcing his arrival. Here I come, ready or not. He turns out to be almost as funny as the main villain. Have you no art? We all scrimped and saved to give it to him. Well, maybe if he didn't bang like, well, rabbits, you'd be able to save a little more. Say, where is the papa anyway? He's still in rehab. Arms for the poor. Wait. Yeah, that's how everybody thinks Bitcoin works. The blind man reveals himself to be Robin Hood, giving the birthday boy his hat and bow. You've risked so much to keep our hopes alive. Bless you. Is this the first Disney film with commercial breaks? The birthday boy meets up with his friends to shoot the arrow, but it flies a little too high. <laughs> no, this of course introduces us to Maid Marion, played by Monica Evans, who's playing a game with her lady-in-waiting, Clucky. Well, hello. Please don't tell Prince John. Mama said he'll jump off my head. Oh no, the thumbscrews would be more than enough. The kids get along with Marion, even the ones they clearly always took the first take with. Mama said you and Robin Hood are sweethearts. Oh, that was terrible. And she explains how her and Robin used to be childhood sweethearts. You see, that was several years ago before I left for London. He carved our initials on this tree. Though we don't see Robin and Marion together a ton in this, their acting really does convince us of their history. Keep in mind at the time, if you just had these characters meet up and fall in love in a Disney film, people wouldn't really question it, but giving them this backstory, even though it is off screen, does sell it a little better. I remember it so well. You are gonna have any kids? Jesus, boy, read the room! I mean, how fast do you think relationships go? Robin Hood's gonna have kids! Okay, pretty fast. They play make-believe, pretending the kid is Robin Hood, rescuing Marion from the castle. The hero gives his fair lady a kiss. Oh, that's sissy stuff. Then I will. <laughs> Not okay! Just because you look like a Lady Fox McCloud doesn't mean you can barrel roll into first base, you predator! You literal predator! Did I mention yet this movie has weird edits? <laughs> <laughs> Why does every fade out look like the last time we see a character alive? <laughs> Marion still dreams about Robin, wondering if he still remembers her at all. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Or forgetful. Now help me hang this poster above my bed. Not again, lady. It's so crusty. It turns out Robin is also dreaming about her, but he's afraid too much time has passed. Just marry the girl. You don't just walk up to a girl, hand her a bouquet, and say, Hey, remember me? We were kids together. Will you marry me? Marion, my love, will you marry me? Oh, darling, I thought you'd never ask me. Jesus, Prince John and his are taking things slower than these two. Andy Devine plays Friar Tug, who lets them know about an archery contest in which Maid Marion will give a kiss to the winner. Maid Marion. Maid Marion. She's gonna give a kiss to the winner. <laughs> kiss to the winner. Well, that just sketches my facial proportion guide. Yeah, I guess I should talk about the animation a bit. Like a lot of Disney films of the time, they used the Xerox method, which meant the pencil drawings were printed directly on the cell instead of having them inked. In some movies, I don't think this style works, like the Aristocats or Rescuers, I think it looks a little cheap. But in a movie like this, where it's not only more medieval and rustic, but also stars animals, I think it complements the fuzzy textures. It reminds me of the sketchy illustrations in the book intro, so it doesn't feel out of place. Though, I never understood why his seems to be furry. Furry. Yeah, I just answered my own question. I did an opening routine on it! No one sits higher than the king. Must I remind you, his? Nobody must be longer than me. Speaking of which, who's this teddy bear? I am Sir Reginald, Duke of Chutney. Will John and Robin both disguise themselves to get into the tournament, and of course, into Prince John's heart. <laughs> Obviously making his jealous. And now, your mightiness, allow me to lay some protocol on you. That is my department in so many ways! You took the words right out of my mouth, PJ. PJ, I like that. You know I do. Sounds eerily similar to something else I enjoy. Of course, 69ing! I love 69ing! Look, you can give me shit for these jokes all you want, but at the end of the day, they make more than I do. 
Move it, creepy. Get lost. Be gone, long one. I can't believe I'm being DiCaprioed by a Sherbert country bear. The tournament of the Golden Arrow will now begin. Even as the tournament gets going and Robin keeps hitting bullseyes, everyone clearly keeps trying to hit something else. That's what you call pulling it back and letting it go, PJ. I'm aware of the Kama Sutra. Hiss literally looks up dude's skirts until he finds what he's looking for. It's him! It's Robin Hood! I'd recognize that exposed bull sack anywhere! His cherry is burst though and Friar Tuck takes him out of commission. It doesn't take long for John to put together that the winner of the tournament is indeed Robin Hood. And thank god, because if not, there'd literally just be a naked stork standing in front of us right now. Not <laughs> that half of these characters would mind. Marion pleads for his life, confessing her love for him, but it doesn't phase John at all. Traitors to the crown must die! That crown belongs to King Richard! Long live King Richard! Long live, Long live King, King Richard. Richard! He taxed us much more than you! Now really, look it up, Richard had to fund his crusade somehow. <laughs> I expect a better history in a movie where chickens wear underpants. Little John convinces Prince John to let him go. Sheriff, release my buddy! <laughs> Not so hard, you mean thing. I refuse to believe this movie does not want me to make jokes about it. Robin is free, but Little John is found out, resulting in a big fight and a big chase. Again, I would describe it as epic, but it is pretty fun. Hey, who's driving this flying umbrella? It ends with Clucky doing a football parody with the guards. Sure, whatever. And Prince John discovers his in the barrel. Coming, coming. <laughs> oh, I wish I could you sound like our honeymoon night. Get out of that if you can. Hated when I did my Schwartz twisted. Hello, I'm the president of Stamps. That's who I am, don't worry about it. As your god, I invented the holidays. We like the holidays and we look forward to them and we push them earlier and earlier because there's something wrong with us. And the holiday rush means more mailing and shipping for your business. But it doesn't have to mean more stress. You love Stamps.com. And I know this because I'm the president of Stamps and I know you, you're, you're mine. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money for 25 years. It can help you get ready for the holiday ramp up. All you need is Stamps.com's premium rates for all your postage needs. Shut your dirty mouth. It's your own personal post office, wherever you are. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and printer. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. Now taking care of orders on the go is even easier with the Stamps.com mobile app. If you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Hooray for Stamps! Stamps got this! Stamps got you. It's premium discounts and supplies at your fingertips. Running low, order shipping and mailing supplies, labels, and even printers from your supply store. Get huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates to help your bottom line. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over a million businesses. Get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right now from your computer anytime, day or night. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. Get your business ready for the holiday rush. What? Get started at Stamps.com today. Sign up at Stamps.com slash nostalgia for a special offer that includes a four week free trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com slash nostalgia. This isn't over between us. Got a war for the first time every Friday on Twitch. We also have content five days a week. Hope to see you there. Robin takes May Mary into his hideout in probably the most 70s song of the movie. Cat Stevens as a literal cat wouldn't be more 70s than this. But it turns out his hideout isn't so secret as all of Nottingham shows up. Surprise! Long live Robin Hood! Yeah, it was kind of getting intimate here, guy. Okay, party, I guess. Let's celebrate by giving animation YouTubers something to edit for years to come. A minute before he knows we're there, old Rob will snatch his underwear. I hope you're keeping count at home. There's literally more overtones in this than Rocco's Modern Life cartoon.
The song Mocking Prince John is so catchy, even the sheriff and his start singing it, without realizing the prince is listening. This is a pretty great bit. Tis sure to be known as John the Worst. Marvelous, merciful. Well, you got it all wrong. The sniveling, groveling, wheezing. Get out! <laughs> ah, reminds me of another whiny orange ruler with little hair on his head who couldn't take a joke. That's right, Warren Harding. <laughs> Cry, baby. John raises the taxes so high, even the narrator gets thrown in jail. Guess he didn't pay his narration tax. And we get our big downer song of the film. Every town has its ups and downs. Man, even the kids are in prison? what they do, allowance embezzlement? If we were so down, we'd up and leave. Jesus, why don't we just cut to the pound and lady and the tramp? It's starting to look colorful compared to this. Well, it looks like I dropped by just in time. At a nearby chapel, the sheriff takes the last bit of money from the poor box, causing Friar Tuck to finally lose his nerve. I'll give you taxes! How dare you scam people out of money? Our church was doing that fine! Friar Tuck is arrested, which is music to Prince John's ears, who's still obsessed with capturing Robin Hood. Friar Tuck will be led to the gallows. And Friar Tuck? You'll be excommunicated for sure! Yes, don't bring actual politics into this world. Yeah, for as light as this movie is, that is a pretty dark suggestion coming off of an already pretty depressing song. Good thing we have literal gallows humor to lighten things up. Don't you reckon we'd ought to give that there trap door a taste? <laughs> now I know why your mama called you nutsy. Three testicles is nothing to laugh at, Sheriff. Robin catches news of the friars hanging and stages a jailbreak that night. They knock out one of the guards and take his place. Put that pea shooter down. Shucks, Trigger, it's only Nutsy. Dressed up like Robin Hood, dressed up like Nutsy. Close your sleep a little eyeballs. Why don't you uh, let me loosen that belt? This was the horniest Disney production ever animated, and that's saying a lot. Little John frees the prisoners while Robin tries to steal all of Prince John's riches. Mm, leave Becky and Alex. They've been fussy. Yeah, they sleep in the same room. He is literally licking his feet. Even Burton Ernie would be like, Boy, they just rub it in your face, don't they? I wish somebody would do more of that. In all seriousness, this scene is pretty great. It's like Mission Impossible for kids, mostly quiet building up the inevitable outburst of action you know is around the corner. The quieter it is, the more tension it builds. Take one guess what he's dreaming about. <laughs> oh, Scarabi, you'll always be my Lion King. <laughs> Kiss your porno music woke me up again. Whoa! Yes! This climax is a lot of fun, with a lot of kinetic energy, good laughs, and some decent action. Even if not, every performance is perfect. Mama, mama, wait for me! If Willy Wonka's not caring memes were a three-year-old, she would be it. Robin is trapped in the castle as pretty much everything is trying to get him. The suspense builds higher and higher as the music slowly becomes Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> and Robin jumps, seemingly not having made it. But he outsmarted them and lives to fight another day. It's so miserably unfair! By the way, if you're wondering, what the hell happened to Maid Marian as she all but vanishes from the film until literally the last minute? It turns out there was an alternate ending where Robin did in fact get injured and Marian tries to nurse him back to health. John follows him and tries to kill him off, but King Richard returns and takes back the crown. It definitely feels more like a complete ending, but honestly, the one we got isn't bad. It's just a little quicker and to the point. The narrator says King Mufasa, I mean King Richard returned, and fixed all their problems right up. King Richard returned and, well, he, he just straightened everything out. Well, he didn't straighten out things too much. We wouldn't have half a movie if he did. Robin marries Marion and we get a moment I always thought would make more sense when I grew up, but honestly it just raised more questions. How come you are going? Well... Robin Hood's gonna have kids, so somebody's gotta keep their eye on things. You know what? I don't think that's a good mom. She lets her son have a weapon, drags her kids to jail with her, leaves some behind. She lets others run away to be a burden on her savior's honeymoon. Someone should rob her of her kids and give them to DCFS. <laughs> well, folks, that's the way it really happened. 
Well, the orgies might have been exaggerated, but... Oh, we cut that out of this version? Oh, okay, never mind. And that was Robin Hood. I honestly still find it a very charming movie. Like I said, I can't say it's one of Disney's greats, but its laid-back attitude, instantly likable cast, and clever choices of animals representing different characters makes it a fun little adventure. Everybody is just dripping with personality, and nothing else, I swear. You just feel a sense of fun whenever any of these actors say a line. I kind of wish I was a fly on the wall just listening to these performances being recorded. For a lot of kids, this is their introduction to the character. I know it certainly was for me. And I think by having the book in the opening and showing him as a human being in another story, that kind of shows there are other versions, and they're worth checking out. But I don't think this is a bad introduction for kids. I think it establishes right from the beginning it is going to be more of a laid-back version, and I think the charm in the way they tell their story does really rub off. And speaking of rub-off, yeah, the innuendos, though, like I said, probably unintentional, are freaking hilarious. <laughs> Again, I don't think that was the point, but it does make for a different, yet still equally funny experience watching this from a kid to an adult. <laughs> Regardless, everybody works off each other great, whether you read anything into it or not. I can't say it's a great epic, but I can definitely say it's a great time. And, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff in the world, but... Weird doesn't always mean bad. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, what were we so afraid of? Like someone's gonna track us down for this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Nostalgia critic, it's the sheriff. It's the sheriff! Yes! We know about your perverted ways, you heathen sons of bitches. But sheriff, it's nothing like that. I've never even met a fox before! <laughs> yeah, they kidnapped me and forced me to like cartoons! I don't even like things with outlines on them! <laughs> Pieces of shit better pray to whatever furry god you believe in, because on the count of ten, I'm gonna feel you with so much lead, even lead paint would get lead poisoning from you. One. No, 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 um, sure. What is it? Well, I've never told anybody this. Walter, it's okay. We're friends. All right. Since I was a kid, I've been attracted to the California raisins. <laughs> oh, Walter. That's easy to explain. It is? Yeah. You're a freak. Cock blocker? I've got a dirty thumb. Spoken like a true furry virgin. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, I didn't know you were bilingual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where are your accents? <laughs> hey, Lackey Daisy wanted me for a reason. <laughs> This month, for cameos for charity, we're doing Red Cross. We've been seeing a lot of disasters in nature recently, and the Red Cross specializes in trying to help any way they can. Whether it's providing blood, sending in volunteers, helping near or far with disasters big or small, Red Cross provides a number of different ways to save lives. So if you want a cameo of me saying happy birthday or good luck or whatever, click on the link below and be giving to a good cause. Or if you're like, screw you, I can't even look at you, well, consider giving to this organization anyway. You can give money, give blood, or even volunteer. They're amazing people that literally save lives and you can help them out. Click on the link and see if this is a cause you can give to.